We have been living with the coronavirus for several months. What do we know now and what should we anticipate as we move forward? Finding balance in a world with COVID-19. Tonight, on call with the Prairie Doc. On call with the Prairie Doc. I'm your Prairie Doc, Dr. Andrew Ellsworth. Joining us tonight via Skype, Dr. Justin Glass, Program Director of the Family Medicine Residency of Boise, Idaho, and Dr. Nathan Miller, a Vera Medical Group Hospitalist, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, who is joining us on Zoom. Welcome. Justin, please tell us a little about your background and practice in Idaho and, and how you decided to go to New Jersey and help take care of patients there with COVID-19. Look, family doc who did most of my training out in the Western US. I'm originally from Washington State and kind of settled in New Mexico for a little while where I was an IHS doc on Navajo area and then made my way into medical education um, and joined a family medicine residency in Boise as a faculty member and then eventually the program director. I've been there for about 12 years. Um, love that, love training. Uh, small town family docs, um, had the opportunity to work with Dr. Ellsworth back in part of his training. Um, and it's just a real fulfilling career to do that. And as COVID rolled out uh, across the US over uh, the course of March and early April, we did all the steps I think you all have done here in South Dakota about trying to mitigate the risks and, and help keep our population safe. and it became pretty evident that we were in a relatively good spot in mid-April. And I made the decision to see if I could go out to a pretty hard hit area on the Northeast um, uh, region to see if I could help. And I uh, was lucky enough to set up a, a hospitalist job in a hospital that was really pretty overwhelmed with COVID. Wow, what was that like going to a completely different hospital, working with unfamiliar physicians and nurses and staff and busy fighting a brand new virus? Yeah, it was a really interesting uh, process to walk into that of just having to uh, walk into the unfamiliarity and, you know, to some degree, the danger of COVID and all the steps you have to do uh, to to be in a hospital where you're working every day with very sick patients with COVID and then do that in an unfamiliar setting. And I, I just have to do a shout out to the medical community there. They had been pretty overwhelmed for about three weeks when I showed up to double their night hospitalist staff. They had one hospitalist who couldn't keep up with the work and I became the second pair of hands. Um, and they embraced me from nursing staff to respiratory therapists to the docs. Um, everybody jumped in and helped me over those first few days just to figure out the system. And um, they all knew that they needed the additional help and, and that the patients would really benefit by having uh, more hands on deck. And uh, I, I kind of fell in love with the hospital there. It's, you know, most people who dedicate themselves to, to medicine are just really fun to work with and uh, walked away from New Jersey with a really good feeling and kind of just like out here in the West, uh, how much they cared. The, uh, it's really mar remarkable you did that. Were people um, scared there or on edge or, or just doing their job or, or what was it like, the, the feel and, and, and from the people you worked with and the people that you were taking care of? Yeah, um, you know, the risk was pretty palpable. You walk through the front door of that hospital as a physician on staff and you, you change your mindset. Um, we, we had about 50, 55 patients who were sick enough with COVID to be in the hospital, most with very high oxygen needs, many in the ICU on ventilators. They'd had to open a mothballed ICU to double their capability. So the whole time there as a healthcare provider, you're, you're thinking about your protection and not spreading it to anybody else. Um, but I would say once you get in that flow and you're used to it, um, really the team was in that same flow and we would make decisions every night about who needed to go into a room, what tasks needed to be done, how do we care for this patient despite the COVID in the best way we could, um, but also using things like walkie talkies from outside the room to inside the room so a physician and nurse could work together but not waste 
um, important personal protection equipment and and use the windows of the room, use um, technology to help us with the care. And I, I think overall it went really well. Yeah, well, I, I certainly enjoyed my time out in Boise working with you, Dr. Glass, Justin, and uh, I knew you'd be great for the program here tonight. And, and uh, it, I had a great time out there, but it's been nice being back here in South Dakota. And, and a fellow South Dakotan here, Nate Miller, uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself and what it's been like taking care of patients with COVID-19 in, in Sioux Falls at Avera. Yeah, thanks for uh, having me, Andrew. So a little background, I grew up in South Dakota. I'm from Parker, small town just west of Sioux Falls and went to the uh, great uh, state school of South Dakota State University and then went to uh, Vermilion U University, South Dakota Sanford School of Medicine for Med School. I actually did my residency in town and I've been employed at Avera McKinnon as a hospitalist for seven years and uh, also worked with internal medicine residents at uh, McKinnon. And then currently right now, uh, I, am on one of, I am on one of the COVID units rounding at, as a hospitalist at McKinnon. How's that looking right now in Sioux Falls? Are our cases going up or down? Are, are, are we at capacity or do we have a lot of room or, or what's it looking like? Well, fortunately, uh, we have uh, some institutions in Sioux Falls who have good foresight. They have plans in place if we need them. Right now, we are doing okay. Hopefully, we don't need those plans, uh, and we will be completely fine if we don't have to implement them. But right now, uh, we do have adequate capacity. Good. What, what are some of the current treatments you're using for patients with COVID-19? Uh, excellent question. So a lot of it comes back to bread and butter medicine, doing what we know works best. Uh, they say in medicine first do no harm. So most of the new medications that are, we are trying are in the context of a study. Uh, key things for us are incentive spirometry. So that's breathing deeply into a, a, a machine that helps open up your lungs to prevent pneumonia. Uh, oxygen, and then really it's called supportive care, meaning helping them uh, treat their symptoms. Uh, now we do are, are involved in some clinical trials. Uh, one, we're in, involved in an arm of a uh, male clinical trial. We're uh, involved in convalescent plasma uh, administration to those who meet the criteria. In addition, we do have remdesivir available that has been allocated by, I believe, the state um, and our infectious disease specialists and pharmacists and team are helping guide us in that, ensuring it's appropriately used. And we also are uh, looking at uh, use of medications such as uh, postaluzumab, so IL-6 inhibitors, of course, within the context of a, a study. Good. <laughs> with, with the rise of cases at Smithfield, did, could you tell that in the hospital? I mean, did you see any changes once cases were rising with the Smithfield plant? Uh, we did see probably in late April uh, a bump in cases, uh, definitely higher acuity uh, uh, in number of patients that we saw. Justin, now that you've been back to Idaho, um, does it feel different there? I mean, do you have some cases in the hospital in Boise or has it been pretty slow there? Yep. Ida Idaho had the county with the highest rate of COVID early in the infection. That was Blaine County, which is where Sun Valley, Ketchum are, and kind of a, a story where folks came in for a conference and skiing and brought infection probably from the Seattle, San Francisco area, and that then spiraled out into the community. Um, that has died out with appropriate social distancing and interventions, and we have, I would say we're kind of at a background um, rate of some inpatient cases more in one of our hospital systems than the other. Um, we just have stepped up kind of um, re-entry in terms of group sizes that are allowed and businesses that are allowed to open. So all of us are watching closely the daily case counts and kind of the pattern that's going to develop over this next couple of weeks. Um, but for me, dramatic to walk out of the New Jersey um, hospital and back into the Boise hospitals that we're doing kind of the normal breadth of medicine in Boise. We were very focused on COVID care in New Jersey. Did you go right from 
working in New Jersey to working in Boise, or ha have you had to, uh, you know, uh, monitor yourself first for a while? Yeah, it's a it's interesting phase. Uh, I ended up doing 14 days of quarantine, um, a lot of telemedicine uh, with my patients, a lot of uh, faculty work with the residency by Zoom. So I had a whole phase where I was not doing clinical care, and I think that was a, an appropriate decision because of the the rates of cases in New Jersey. Um, I, I didn't get infected so far, but um, I'm probably out of the risk of having been infected in New Jersey by the standard distribution of cases. And now it's much more about my risk in, back in Idaho. Gotcha. Well, though the idea of injecting patients with convalescent plasma has been around for a century, a Johns Hopkins University researcher in March proposed it for COVID-19 patients. On-call producer Ginger Thompson spoke with the hematologist via Zoom regarding this experimental therapy being given at Avera. Plasma, um, which is the liquid part of blood, has proteins called antibodies, which uh, are typically produced by the body in successive waves to, to combat infections, uh, typically, say in this case, viral infections. And the way these antibodies help in treating a viral infection definitively is by neutralizing the virus, so they call neutralizing antibodies. So the premise here is that uh, plasma from patients with proven COVID-19 infections who recovered from the infection after a period of 10 to 14 days would have mounted an immune response sufficient enough to hopefully protect them, and therefore those antibodies could be used to protect other people. We do not have those answers refined for COVID-19 yet. We know those people produce antibodies. We don't know if they're neutralizing antibodies. We don't know how long lasting they are. We don't know if they will protect from reinfection. That is all being studied by experts around the country and the world. When should doctors consider this treatment for COVID-19 patients? We're considering it early in the course of disease. So. Uh, Typically within a few days of uh, hospitalization is what is, uh, would be, uh, we think would be ideal. So we use it, it's only used for patients who are hospitalized. It's not at the moment available for patients who are feeling well and at home with problem COVID-19 infection. Is this treatment being used at Avera or in this area? It is being used at Avera, yes. The donor should uh, have be at least 14 days from the last reported symptoms. And uh, sometimes it can take up to 28 days before they can, they, um, they can donate. But what this therapy can, will prove to us is the safety and the efficacy of doing it. And you know they will be looking at the antibody titers on all of these uh, patients uh, uh, once that information becomes available and then they will try to marry to the information to see if those particular units produce better benefits or, or not. It has worked before for other viral illnesses. I don't think we can extrapolate that to this one. All we know is it can be done safely. That's the, that's the preliminary data. Uh, the efficacy will be demonstrated when we get the published results when all the patients' experience have been analyzed. This is has been the only antiviral approach of any proven benefit in viral infections available to be tried in COVID-19 patients to date. This is your program and your questions are key to the direction of our discussion. Call in your questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email to ask at prairiedoc.org. So Justin, we, you know, we, we've been living and breathing this COVID-19 for, for a few months now, but I do want to step back and, and you know, represent because uh, some of the symptoms that people can feel with COVID-19 because they have expanded the list as we mo know more about about uh, the virus. So if you could uh, elaborate on that for us, please. It was one of the most fascinating things to me. I did most of the night admissions for a month at a hospital in Trenton, New Jersey. And the chief complaints that 
that uh, patients were coming in with were quite diverse. Uh, I think probably the, the framework to understand it the best is that virus likely enters through an ACE uh, uh, receptor, that's its entry point, and those are scattered through the pulmonary or lung um, bronchial upper respiratory tree and through the GI tract. And so the complaints I saw varied from shortness of breath, trouble breathing, uh, to uh, cough, to fevers, chills, constitutional stuff, to GI problems like diarrhea or um, nausea, vomiting, to I just don't feel well or I haven't eaten for a couple days. And then the last category I put there, because I actually dealt with a large prison population. The hospital I worked at had the contract with all the state prisoners in New Jersey, which is about 19,000 prisoners, was the nurse checked my oxygen level and it was very low and I didn't realize I was having any problems and she got nervous or he got nervous and sent me over here to the hospital. Well, what were some of the challenges taking care of, of, of a prison population? Yeah, it, it was, uh, it, it's been a hard story in New Jersey. Uh, COVID got into the prisons a little bit early and it's probably been the worst hit prison system in the, the country. Um, caseload, deaths, and even spreading into the, the prison guards. Part of the hospital I worked with was part of the prison. They naturally had inpatients at the hospital. And when I walked through the doors there in mid-April, every floor had maybe a third to half prisoners with prison guards outside of their rooms. Um, and it was, it was almost all older, sicker prisoners. Um, many ethnic uh, group minority uh, prisoners who had chronic medical conditions were hit the hardest in terms of severity of illness and, and therefore need for pulmonary support like we were hearing early around our typical therapies. Nate, um, what are some of the things you've noticed about COVID-19, taking care of patients with COVID-19? Really, uh, essentially the same uh, symptoms that were just mentioned. Uh, most commonly, it is fever. Although the fever, interestingly, doesn't always isn't the first symptom that occurs. This dry cough, anorexia, not being not feeling like they want to eat anything. Uh, I have had a few who've had a change in taste, but that's probably more rare than than not from my perspective. And a lot of them have really this uh, rip, roaring, chest pain that hurts when they take in a deep breath. That's been a fairly common thread that I've seen as well. Have you seen it where a patient comes in a little more mild, uh, but it becomes more severe, you know, maybe in that second week of the illness? Yes, uh, we have seen that there. Uh, uh, we definitely keep an eye on that seven day, seventh day, between seven and 10 days after the onset of symptoms, which is when you most commonly see it. And we have, we have seen that fortunately, it, we can usually thus far have been able to uh, watch closely enough that it didn't necessarily catch us by surprise yet, but uh, uh, we've been fortunate so far. So, You know, especially early on, I, I know it's been hard uh, getting some of these patients off a ventilator once they're on a ventilator. Um, I saw one statistic that said patients over 65, if they gone on a ventilator, uh, maybe only 3% ever got off of it or, and, and survived and left the hospital. You know, I don't know if that's what you're seeing in the hospital there at Avera, Nate. You know, I don't know the specific statistics and I actually haven't worked in the ICU yet. That'll come here in another few weeks on the COVID, but we're doing, we are doing everything possible not to have them intubated. Uh, uh, we want to keep them on humidified high flow nasal cannula oxygen at the very most, uh, ideally in a negative pressure room. Um, uh, and what we really don't know what, is- What is that a negative pressure room? How, do, well, how does that work or how does that help? I'll do my best to explain it. Uh, probably some of the uh, facility engineers could do better, but uh, essentially what it is, it creates a vacuum. So uh, the virus uh, is uh, air, can be aerosolized during certain procedures, uh, certain uh, methods of oxygenate, oxygenation. 
and it creates it so the the air flows in as opposed to out, thus decreasing the likelihood of uh, spreading. And uh, Avera is actually we've created a number of different pods into negative pressure rooms that weren't previously and uh, if needed have the capability to create a fair amount more. Yeah, that way basically is not air leaving the room and going to other areas of the hospital. It's getting sucked up and just staying in that room, right? Correct. Now I understand it. Um, Justin, you know, I, as far as, I don't know if you took care of patients in the ICU there or not, but did you see much success once they were on a ventilator? Yeah, it was was a really tough part of our, our practice is that the um, fatality rate in the ICU, especially in the early weeks of, of the process, where I think the natural response was to intubate, partly to control the airway and lower the risk to healthcare workers. It was very hard to see success with patients. Um, many experimental therapies that Nate was talking about, uh, not a lot effective. Um, probably the most effective thing you can do with a ventilated patient is to change the position of the patient. The term we use is proning the patient. So instead of laying on your back all the time, you spend 16 hours laying on your stomach and eight hours laying on your back. There's great dangers to turning a patient over who has a breathing tube down their throat. Just in the process of turning, you can dislodge that, put that in the wrong place. So most hospitals have built teams of you know, pretty experienced nurses, wound care, RT to, to make those spins. And the natural progression at the hospital I was working at was for us to do everything Nate was talking about, try to keep patients off the ventilator and let them move more. Um, if we use non-invasive uh, ventilation methods, high flow oxygen, and um, we avoided some of the complications that come from just being stuck very sick in an ICU. We ran into problems of running out of equipment. We had every setup for high flow oxygen in the hospital being used, and we could have used twice as many uh, setups. So, you know, when these conversations come up about um, trying to avoid a surge that could overwhelm a hospital system, I think there's still places in this country that, that are gonna be pushed to the edge if we have a moderate surge in cases where um, we'll run out of some pieces of equipment, some uh, healthcare worker expertise, because I think another issue that comes up here is burnout um, and kind of nursing staff being able to pull extra shifts over and over and over. So I, I do have concerns still about being able to fully staff everything if we have caseloads go up all over. Did you spend some time with patients talking about their code status, whether or not they, if they needed to be intubated, whether they should or wanted to be intubated? We did. This, this was big and it, it was a lot of our effort in the sickest patients who were before the ICU or even going into the ICU. The conversations are hard, eh? Most hospitals don't have um, much in the way of visitors right now. I'm not sure exactly how it is in Sioux Falls at the moment, but um, everywhere out in the Northeast was no visitors allowed in the hospital except for extraordinary situations. And then I was also dealing with more than half the patients being prisoners where there's very strict uh, requirements about whether you can reach out to families or not. So the conversations were via FaceTime or some type of video platform on a phone in a bag taken into the room. And then the biggest complication of it all is the patients are so sick, they're putting their energy into breathing and breathing is everything they can do to stay alive when they're that sick. And so trying to hold a conversation about wishes or what ifs um, really falls on the family member rather than the patient. And that's, that can feel kind of isolating and hard for the family members. To answer your question, the, the hospitals in Sioux Falls are just starting to allow some visitors for patients, but did have that very limited or, or not allowed before. Um, we do have some caller questions. Uh, a woman from Lenox, South Dakota asks, says her twin sister did not get tested for COVID, but she had a positive antibody test. Husband was totally asymptomatic, didn't have symptoms, and also had positive antibodies. She still does not have her sense of smell back. Are they seeing this more and will it come back? I, I know, uh, Nate, you mentioned you didn't see too many patients that had lost their sense of smell 
I, did you have any patients that did lose their smell and, and that, that it came back? Uh, so if it's okay, I'll address two things here, Andrew. Uh, one, uh, regarding the, I only think I had one who had a loss of sense of smell and uh, uh, that uh, is still an ongoing symptom. Uh, two, I, I would be very cautious about interpreting what uh, the convalescent, what the uh, serologies say. We don't really know. And for serology, those are blood tests. We don't really know how to use those yet. We don't know if you, that means you've had it and you can't get it. We don't know if you can get it again. So uh, it really we don't know really what that test means just yet. Right, and the result isn't a, a guarantee either, I might add, because with the, with the blood test to check for those antibodies, um, there's a higher false positive. It, it, it might have said you had it when you really didn't have it, and there's a higher false negative rate too. So it's, it's, that's why we haven't used that a, a lot, at least in our health system yet, because it's just uh, not as reliable. Um, a, a woman here asks if there is something that can be infused into a mask that could kill the virus. Um, I don't know, Justin, if you've had any uh, experience or heard of anything like that. Yeah, I, I think in general, the mask, uh, you know, masks come in a couple of different forms. I think a healthcare worker in with a high risk situation is gonna use an N95. A healthcare work, worker around normal situations is gonna use a normal surgical mask. And in most situations in our lives, when we're out in the grocery store or kind of around people in a somewhat social distanced manner, you know, we can't control all that because of people walking by us. A normal, well-made fabric mask is gonna do okay. I think at this point, there's no recommendation to add um, antiviral um, liquid, bleach, anything like that to the mask. Um, it's just the, the barrier method of the mask. And I, I think I would keep your hands clean if you're touching something that's that you think could be contaminated, but that's probably a secondary condition or secondary consideration to the mask. A woman states that she ordered 50 paper masks from Amazon. When they arrived, she saw that they were made in China. Are they safe to use? Would you say they were safe to use, Justin? Yeah, from my perspective, um, they're safe to use. If they're paper masks, I mean, I think I'd look at the integrity of what they look like, but I wouldn't be nervous because of the location they were made. They wouldn't carry COVID from China to her um, in that transport process. That's, that's an extremely low risk situation and wearing the mask in a public setting is the most important thing. Uh, a gentleman stated that at the end of February and early March, he had a fever of 102, severe chills, headache, short of breath. He thinks he had COVID. Now, I might add here that we were testing always for influenza and COVID in early March, and almost all of those had come back positive for influenza and not COVID at the time. He called his doctor, and they did not think he had COVID, and they did not test him. He lives alone and was worried that something could have happened to him and no one would know. Well, that ties into our next role in here because we hear a lot about COVID-19 patients who are hospitalized, but what about those who are homebound with the infection? Avera has a program that monitors these patients while they're isolated. In March, we realized that um, modeling at that point in time was going to cause a uh, great uh, strain on our hospitals, um, outpatient clinics, ERs, that type of stuff. And so we started the uh, COVID hotline at that time to better be able to know how to um, uh, answer patients' questions, get them tested at that time, and, and there still are certain criteria that patients have to meet in order to get tested. And as we started seeing those numbers increase and we were doing our surge planning for the hospitals, we realized that we're gonna potentially run out of beds. And so we have to come up with a way to continue to monitor these patients, potentially keep them at home, not only because of a bed need standpoint, but also you know, trying to preserve PPE, which was in much shorter supply at that time. Uh, we had providers that were potentially gonna be pulled out of the clinic and they were gonna be in the hospital. So from a, just from a limited resource standpoint, we thought that this was an excellent model to go to. When we started looking at uh, research and, and data coming out of uh, coronavirus cases, we realized that about 40% of patients are gonna be asymptomatic. Um, they're not gonna need 
uh, any care at all. They don't even know that they have uh, coronavirus. And there's another 40% roughly that are going to be symptomatic, but are not going to have to be in the hospital. And it's that population that, once again, this, this program is for. And then there's another 20% that uh, are going to need uh, increased um, medical resources, hospitalization, and so it's that 40 percent that is symptomatic that doesn't need to be in the hospital um, that we want to get into this program and, and uh, make sure that we can once again keep them out of the ER, keep them out of our clinics, and uh, prevent providers from getting infected, uh, staff from getting infected, and preserve PPE. Two main types of patients are going to qualify for home monitoring, so patients that are at high risk uh, would be the first category. So those patients may be asymptomatic, but they're over age 65, they have chronic medical conditions such as diabetes, heart disease, COPD, um, other things like that. Um, so they're going to qualify. The other group is going to be patients that are symptomatic, so they're becoming more short of breath, their oxygen is low, uh, but not to the point where we feel like they need to be in the hospital, they just need to have someone keep a close eye on them. Uh, we know with COVID-19, patients can go from feeling pretty well to um, end up being really sick really fast. And so we've had a number of cases where patients are doing well um, and between the morning when they may do a, a phone call with our team to later on that evening, they become more anxious, more short of breath, um, and they need to be reassessed in such a short amount of time. And, and so we do see that from a standpoint, that anxiety, that shortness of breath, um, labored breathing, um, can really come on quick for some patients. Sorry. Patients are monitored for at least 30 days. Um, how frequently they're monitored and to what extent really depends on the particular patient. If they're asymptomatic and they are you know, 10 to 14 days from the time of diagnosis, uh, then, then we drop off to calling them maybe once a week. Uh, other patients are different that are uh, having a lot of symptoms, prolonged course of illness, and they're going to get um, uh, more frequent calls and, and for a longer duration. So it's, it's pretty patient specific. For some patients, particularly those that are at uh, high risk and having a lot of symptoms, then what we can get them is a patient monitoring system, which is a kit of uh, tablet, uh, oximeter, and so that information can then be obtained through this kit. It's a, and there's a software program on it. The patients can answer questions as far as how short of breath they are, what their temperature is, um, how anxious are they? Uh, and then that information off of those questions is then pushed to our uh, clinic team and that will alert them that things are getting worse. We can actually do uh, virtual visits through that software as well. So it's a great way for nursing staff or if providers need to see a patient, we can actually just push okay. a button quickly and right. um, get a, a video visit with that patient and actually see how they're breathing, see how they're doing and better assess them at that point. That's really nice to see that if a patient does get sick that you know and they have to stay at home that someone's watching out for them and and, and you know and, and there to, to answer any questions and to watch them and to make sure they're going to be okay you know as uh, as we're getting into summer people want to be outside more and meanwhile our, our cases have been low and so businesses are reopening and uh, and we're, we're trying to to open things up and, and you know get back to normal but you know what that normal will look like it's hard to say uh nate you know as, as people are planning and looking at these activities for the for the summer or going out on their errands you know what are some of the things they should keep in mind uh excellent question andrew uh i'll uh, borrow a quote from an article that you sent me i think it's from a university of wisconsin uh, epidemiologist who stated uh the four words are uh time space public or time space people place and so what that means is uh the more amount of time you are in a smaller area with more people means you're going to be more likely to contract that uh the illness so if you're in close quarters if you're in an area with a lot of people six feet is important uh you're at a higher risk of contracting an infection if you go to uh, an event that has a lot of people. Uh, now, there are ways we can mitigate those risks. The biggest one is wearing a mask. And I think the key is wearing a mask, uh, it will not necessarily decrease the infection rate for yourself. 
you're really helping out someone's mother, father, grandmother, grandfather, sister, or brother, you're decreasing the risk they will get infected. And so we're helping each other out by wearing those masks. Um, and so uh, social distancing, uh, uh, wearing masks, washing hands, those are the best weapons we have against, uh, against this virus. And it really is prevention is the best weapon. What are some of the things you're doing to protect your family as you go to uh, the hospital and work with patients with COVID-19? Yeah, so uh, it's definitely a different routine than usual. Uh, I no longer wear my wedding ring at the hospital. Uh, I used to wear a shirt and tie and now I'm always wearing scrubs. Uh, I do change uh, before I leave the hospital and come home. First thing I do when I get home is I shower and actually, when I'm on the COVID unit, I uh, do uh, socially isolate myself and live in a separate area than my family. Yeah. Justin, um, what are some of your thoughts about plans to reopen businesses and various activities? I'm sure you're seeing or hearing about that in Idaho as well. Yeah, I think the, I think the most important concept I would throw out to add to what was just said is Who's the most vulnerable person that you have regular contact with? When, when you think about your household or extended household that you're having contact with, who's, who's at the most risk to get COVID? And if that's a 81 year old parent uh, with multiple medical conditions, then that family unit is a different family unit to me than one where there's two 20 year old, two 28 year old parents and two young kids. Um, there are risks to young kids, there are risks to 28 year olds, but the risks are, are in a much different status than they are to the 81 year old. So I think we have to do the socially appropriate thing of follow the recommendations that are being, putting out, being put out by our political leaders in each state or even sometimes in a county or a city. But I also think um, there are families that are just gonna have to play this one in a much slower fashion because they have a person who's so at risk and and really should be more cautious for a longer time period. You, you mentioned about young families and, and a Madison, South Dakota woman asked, there have been reports of children getting the virus and getting very sick and it affects them differently. Ha, have there been children in Idaho or South Dakota have been getting very sick with COVID? I don't know if you've heard of any cases there in Idaho. Um, I think she's probably referring to the MISC. <laughs> if you could elaborate on that, please. Yeah, to my knowledge, we have not had a pediatric case of that yet. It could have happened in the last couple of days that I'm not aware of. The, the one that we kind of received some teaching around was in Portland, Oregon, and, and they kind of reached out to help our community, medical community, get up to speed. Um, the largest case series uh, of, of, this, of this effect of the disease has been in New York City, of course, where the most cases of COVID. And I, I think it points out this is a disease that's evolving that we don't understand fully, what therapies work, what the full spectrum of disease is. Kidneys are very injured by this in adults. There's the clotting cascade is an incredible concept with this disease, um, getting blood clots. And now we have this multi-system, you know, inflammatory process happening in kids. So everybody to a degree is at risk of having it. Um, but in the big picture of things, uh, age, uh, ethnic minority, um, uh, and folks with multi, um, you know, comorbidity, multi comorbidities are much higher risk. Yeah, yeah. A gentleman from Rapid City asked if there's any concern from catching the virus from rubbing or touching the eyes. Nate, I don't know if you could uh, touch on that, please. Sure, so just to clarify, the question was if you can catch uh, the virus when touching your eyes, Right, yeah, rubbing or touching your eyes. You could, it's, uh, it's a mucous membrane. And so you can, in theory, uh, we don't know for sure, but you could acquire it that way. The greatest way you'll get it is uh, inhalation. But uh, that's why it's important to wash your hands. Yeah, even in our clinic, they're having us wear face masks to try to protect our eyes from any droplets that could could hit our eyes and and get infected that way you know another way is if if you're adjusting or, or or trying to move your mask around all the time and you just got done touching a 
a surface that maybe someone with COVID-19 was touching, it is possible that you could get it, get it that way as well. Um, Justin, you alluded to the, the ACE uh, system that how the cells can enter the body, how the virus can attack the body. Um, and and I'm, I apologize if this is, can be a complicated question, but a woman from Sioux Falls, South Dakota asked how ACE inhibitors, and that's a medication many people are on for blood pressure, how they might be beneficial for treated, treating COVID-19. And I'm not sure if you have any comments regarding that, Justin. Yeah, it's on several levels, it's been a question that, that kind of has run through the medical community beginning in January with the cases in, um, in China. And the initial concern was that ACE inhibitors actually um, may be a problem because when you're taking an ACE inhibitor, you upregulate the ACE receptor. You get more receptors, more numbers on each cell, which is more points of entry for the virus. But that has not panned out to be um, felt to be a risk factor for uh, disease. And the general statement I've been following is if you're on an ACE inhibitor to control your blood pressure or related to diabetes and kidney disease or for whatever reason you're on it, it's better to keep your um, medical conditions controlled and taking that medicine than stopping it. And it's certainly reasonable to talk to your doctor about that concept but we are not stopping ACE inhibitors. We're not starting them because of COVID. A viewer states, I see news stories that talk about fatality rate, mortal mortality rate and death rate of COVID. Are all these the same thing? And how does it compare to influenza rates? Nate, can you touch on that? Well, they all have a little bit different variants and I will freely admit I'm not a guru at uh, statistics. So, uh, I can't really uh, define the definitions, but regarding uh, uh, fatality rate, there is a higher, as of, as of now, as of now, there is a higher fatality rate in patients with COVID than there is has been in the past with influenza. I might put up a, a graph here uh, when we're looking at influenza. Um, it, 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 it's interesting you know, it peaked February 3rd here in South Dakota. Um, and you can see by March 21st, influenza was just dropping like a rock. And I don't know if we have the graphic comp compared to previous years, but it, it's never dropped off like that before. So I might point out that we saw how once people started doing these social isolation measures and uh, social distancing measures, influenza just dropped down but COVID still was able to, to rise because it is more contagious. Um, as far as the fatality rates, you know, we still don't know that, that total bottom number, how many people have COVID for sure, not one, because we can't test every one, and, and, and two, uh, because there's so many that may not have symptoms, and how many don't have symptoms is what we still need to find out to be able to calculate that true fatality rate. However, um, it is still looking like the fatality rate may be at, still at least as high as 10 times uh, higher with COVID-19. Um, I don't know if Justin or Nate, if you guys would add anything else to that too from what you've seen. Uh, maybe I'll say Justin. I would, I would echo that. I think uh, COVID right now has a higher fatality rate and um, I agree, it's hard to know how many actual infections we have versus the cases we've tested. Everybody's pretty aware of the fact that we've had testing limitations since the beginning of this disease. So if our case fatality rate is 0.4, 0.5% based on the number of tests we've run, the actual fatality rate is gonna be lower than that because more people were infected and we didn't know about it. And so it's probably something like 0.2% or 0.3%, but that will be a process to figure out as we go forward. But that's a that's a high fatality rate. You know, Justin, many people delayed medical care in the last couple months. Do you feel it's time for patients to resume non-urgent medical care? Yeah, I mean, I, I think medicine has changed. And so we're seeing um, that this telehealth option for medical care of actually being able to reach your provider, whether that's a PA, an NP, a MD, a DO, um, or affiliated uh, uh providers, uh, it's, it's an amazing thing. We're really able to reach a lot of folks who had a hard time with transportation or 
or the dynamics of getting in. And we can give good medical care that way. But I agree, it's, there's a lot that needs to be done in the office. And I think now we're starting to see people make decisions about the risk benefit ratio of coming into the office for, for care. And we don't want to delay um, important medical condition um, follow up or new symptom workup um, too long. Yeah, Nate, you know, we've just got about a minute left here. You know, do you see any change? How do you think COVID-19, you know, in the next year or two or going forward will change medicine and, and how we treat and take care of our patients? I believe it's gonna, and it already has, it's gonna accelerate our incorporation of uh, telehealth, e-visits, similar to what Justin said. Uh, we are going to uh, want to learn how we live with COVID. Uh, it is safe to come into the clinics. Uh, we Early diagnosis works and it improves outcomes. Uh, the clinics do have measures and the hospitals do have measures too to decrease the risk of catching that COVID. We've seen a significant decrease in the hospitalized patients for other general medical conditions. And our concern is that people are not coming in. And when they do come in, it may be a little bit too late. So if you have symptoms, I would encourage you to be seen by your physician. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Going forward, you know, people are going to need to be careful going out and about. And if they can just be mindful of what they're doing and, and, and their distance between people and wearing masks, I think we can resume a lot of our more normal activities with, with, with caution. A big thank you to our guests, Nathan and Justin, for volunteering to give their time, experience, and knowledge to our discussion tonight. We're all getting better at electronic meetings, but it still takes special effort to be successful and is very appreciated. Thank you guys very much. We'll be right back after this. We feel privileged to have had the honor of creating a legacy of service through the Prairie Dock organization. It has been our desire and goal to share health information that is not influenced by marketing or sales, but rather is based on science. We started in the 80s with a newspaper article and expanded in the 90s with a radio show. In 2003, we started a TV program, and in 2010, we added our social media platforms. This has been a team effort made possible by many volunteer physicians and experts serving as hosts and guests. All of them are Prairie Docs. Thanks to them, we've been given the ability to pass the torch so that this legacy may continue beyond my time on this earth. Please join me in embracing our team of Prairie Doc physicians, each committed to this mission. Family physician Andrew Ellsworth, Deb Johnston, and Jill Cruz, along with internist Kelly Evans, all from Brookings, South Dakota. These volunteer physicians, and many others, have in the past and will in the future serve as authors of Prairie Doc newspaper columns, host of our TV and radio programs. Thank, Thank you. you. Life is about balance. We balance our time, our budgets, our work, and our family. If you concentrate too much in one area, you will soon be wanting in another. Additionally, our bodies are constantly working to keep our blood pressure, blood sugar, and temperature in balance. COVID-19 disrupted our balance, both in our lives and for some in our bodies. It overwhelmed some communities with too many people who became sick. Other communities banded together, or rather apart, to slow the virus and protect the most vulnerable. Thankfully, many areas have been successful at slowing the spread and flattening the curve, avoiding the tidal wave of sick people filling the hospitals. However, this came with a great cost to the balance in our economy, our social interactions, and our normal way of life. It revealed and magnified numerous problems. It exposed disparities in healthcare, and it provoked supply chain issues, food chain issues, unemployment, poverty, and misinformation. People have many needs in addition to safety. People often need work not only for money, for food and shelter, but also for fulfillment and purpose. People often need other people because we are inherently social creatures that thrive from being there for others, providing words of encouragement or a caring shoulder to lean on or an embrace. 
living with COVID-19 around us requires a new balance that may change over time. While it would be wonderful, reducing cases to zero is probably not realistic for a while. Meanwhile, our communities need economic activity and we need social interactions. Thus, some people are venturing out more and businesses are reopening. Some places are doing this more cautiously than others. We need to get creative and adjust our expectations of normal for a while. Our elders and those with high-risk conditions may not be safe or feel safe, so we should do what we can to help them. Washing hands, wearing masks, and being mindful of the distance between us are not perfect, but are still the best forms of protection for now. No one knows what the future holds. Perhaps reopening the economy will increase our cases of COVID-19, and perhaps not. Perhaps the virus will dissipate over the summer months. If it reemerges in the fall, will we be ready? Will we plan and use this time to prepare? Will we again work together to protect our fellow man? Let's use this time wisely and find our new balance. This is the final live episode of our 18th season. It has certainly been an eventful year. From learning to deal with the pandemic to the loss of our founder, the original Prairie Doc, Dr. Rick Holm. We think of Rick often and will do our best to fulfill his wish for the program to continue to be a source of good, science-based medical information. There will be encore presentations of episodes for the rest of the summer. Please continue to tune into South Dakota Public Broadcasting or watch on our Facebook page every Thursday at 7 p.m. Central Time. We will be back in the fall with season 19 of On Call with the Prairie Doc. In preparation for that, we are putting together next season's schedule and have a request for you all at home. Is there a subject about which you would like us to do an On Call with the Prairie Doc episode? Please send us your thoughts, either post a Facebook a message on our Facebook page or email us at prairiedoc.org. If you would like more information about this program or to see more episodes, please like and follow us on Facebook or visit us at prairiedoc.org. That does it for tonight. From all of, my, all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Hello to all, I am Dr. Tom Luzier, a practicing allergist in Aberdeen, South Dakota. Born in Kansas, I embraced the diversity of South Dakota. This diversity comes with a price, limited health care resources and information. The Healing Words Foundation through Prairie Doc provides an open, online, interactive, public broadcasting format for reliable health information. As a member of the Healing Words Foundation board, I am asking you please to join me in support of this work, which is funded entirely by donations from you. Please consider making a personal or corporate gift to Healing Words Foundation, a 501c3. Go to prairie.org and click on the donate button and make a valuable contribution. Thank you. Major funding for On Call with Prairie Doc has been provided by. Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call with the Prairie Doc on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call with the Prairie Doc as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, Avera Heart Hospital, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Fishback Financial Corporation, Vance Thompson Vision, Urology Specialists, Brown Clinic, American Academy of Family Physicians Foundation, and South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, Black Hills Medical Society, Aberdeen District Medical Society, Flandreau Madison Brookings District Medical Society, Sioux Falls District Medical Society, Yankton District Medical Society, Dakota Bank, Orthopedic Institute, 
Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Services Committee, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, and Swift Telecommunications. <laughs>